first in a series of lunchtime live webinars. We're still finalizing um, the details of those that follow today, but keep a lookout for what promises to be a great program involving some wonderful personalities in our world of food. I'm Jackie Pickles and I'm the current president of LDE London. And for those of you who don't know us and what we stand for, uh, we are the London chapter of LDEI, Les Dames d'Escoffier International. It's a philanthropic organization founded over 40 years ago by a wonderful woman called Carol Brock. And it was founded for women working in the culinary fields raising money for charity, supporting each other, and mentoring those new to the profession. So stretching from restaurants to journalism, manufacture and marketing, chocolate, cheese, and winemaking, it, it's right across the board. There are over two and a half thousand members globally, mainly in the US, and we're a, a group of about 35 in London, always looking for new members so please do look us up get in touch for further information if it interests you and you feel that you um, are in the right you know field to join us look up ldei.org um, or laydownlondon.org so today we have two of our members um, for the first webinar i am thrilled that the much loved and admired writer, Elizabeth Luard, is with us to speak about her many lives in and around food. And who better to interview or chat with Elizabeth than her longtime publisher and friend, Anne Dollamore of the great Grub Street Publishing. I'm not sure how you're gonna cover nine lives in the next 45 minutes, ladies. Um, so I'll shut up, I'll hand you over to Anne and hopefully we'll have a good 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So please put your, your um, questions in the chat and I'll field those later. All right, so um, over to you, Anne. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for such a splendid turnout and a big thank you to Elizabeth for joining us in this first experimental, uh, which we hope will be the first of many. Um, Elizabeth's mostly um, known to everybody who will have signed up today for her um, food uh, writing and her cookbooks, um, and justifiably so, but we thought it might be rather fun on this um, um, chat to throw the net a bit wider so we can discover more about her life um, outside of, of food to capture a sense of her childhood, her, her being a wife, being a mother, and, and obviously we'll be dealing with food, but this is an opportunity to, for you to learn perhaps a little bit more about Elizabeth and her life. And as we said, we, we've, we've divided it up into nine segments. I'm going to try and be a very a, a, a very strict timekeeper so that we get through the fascinating elements of Elizabeth's life. Um, and there will be, as Jackie said, a Q&A at the end. And so do field your questions through chat because we're going to collect them all together and then feed them to uh, Elizabeth. Um, also, you will have noticed on the flyer that we are offering a discount on two of Elizabeth's books. Flavour of Andalusia and Preserving Potting and Pickling, which is her latest book. And we've got uh, a prize draw for everybody who's there today, where we will just pluck a name out of the hat and you will receive a free signed copy. I would just say that Elizabeth is in isolation at the moment, in quarantine for 14 days. So if you do order a book, there, may, there will be a couple of weeks delay before for she and I can get together in the same room and I can put a pen in her hand and get her to sign some copies. So if you do want to order uh, an inscribed copy, do email me and at grubstreet.co.uk and we will deal with your order and we will get the copies signed for you and if you want personally inscribed to somebody else. So without more ado from me, um, I'm going to start with Elizabeth's first life, which is 
entitled Montevideo, Life Among the Latins. Elizabeth, that sounds suitably exotic. Please take it away. Uh, just to say, I'm not, I'm only back in, in isolation because um, I've just got back from Turkey, just in case anybody's worried about my state of health. So, <laughs> <laughs> basically, uh, yeah, Montevideo. Well, I was um, the child of uh, diplomats, effectively. My father was killed in the war, so I was a stepchild. And when I was about six years old, um, my stepfather was posted to Montevideo, to Uruguay. And which is at that point the most exotic. I mean, you got there on a boat and it was um, sort of post-war because we are, I was born in 1941, so it was probably 19, what, 47, something like that. And the boat was called the Andes and off we went and we stopped at, um, it was a big liner with a swimming pool and a celebration um, ducking actually when you cross the equator. So I got my first glimpse of um, bananas and pineapples and all sorts of things when we stopped in on the way uh, in Brazil, at Rio de Janeiro and, and looked and um, my mother traveled with a, um, she traveled with a considerable entourage. Um, she had enough money to do this. So we Was had- Was that an entourage of people or luggage, Elizabeth? People, luggage, <laughs> a vehicle. Um, she took a, you know, she, she was, that's what she did. That was her thing. And um, so it was pretty exciting. Um, melon with ginger, can you imagine? That's my first kind of memory. Um, that was what you, you know, on the boat in the, in the big restaurant, melon with ginger. Then Montevideo, um, Montevideo is on the coast, as everybody knows, opposite Buenos Aires. And um, we used to spend holidays in the Andes, summer holidays. Everybody now goes there to ski. So because Nanny, um, nan we had Nanny, we had Nanny, my mother had Nanny. She never really touched her children if she could possibly avoid it, I don't think. She was of that kind of generation. And um, so that was, it was a pretty exotic childhood. Um, I learnt in Spanish and Spanish in the mornings and English in the afternoon in the school because it, we had a strong relationship, the British, with uh, Montevideo. And so that gave me Spanish. And because I was a stepchild rather than the proper line, I could go, I was, nobody paid much attention to me. I used to go and fish for, um, we called mesugo, little, little round fish off the, and my brother, with my brother, um, off the, the harbour. And I went home with the um, maid or the cook at the weekend. So I was sleeping on an old bus um, seat. Uh, the weekends and in some splendor in, well, it wasn't, my stepfather wasn't the ambassador, but you know, it was a big house and all the rest of it. And I think I discovered that the other side of the Green Bay's door, if anybody remembers that, was the most interesting place to be. And the only place I really felt welcome because children, I don't know, diplomatic household, you know, that you, you're not, I was really welcome. I learned just stuff, you know, those round marrows that you can buy now that are perfect for stuffing. So little fingers could do things. So the cook and cook would let me do all that. Um, and I could see that the food on the other side of the green Bay door was more interesting than what was going on on the other side. In what the, was the difference of, of the food on the other side of the green? Was it very sort of simple, you know, um, sort of stews and soups and things and you were, you were actually eating on the other side a rather more sophisticated fare, Elizabeth? No, I wasn't on the sophisticated, I was in the kitchen. Not. No, I mean, you saw that there was a difference on the other side of the door. So what was being served, you know, outside of the kitchen? Outside of the kitchen, it was kind of roast, roast chicken and bread sauce and rather English food and, you know, steaks and chips and that kind of thing. And on the, the right side, the kitchen side, um, it was just grains and vegetables and, you know, really quite cheap food and fresh fish, little fish. And the cook would always, um, she'd actually fry whatever I'd caught and not, you know, that was wonderful. That was absolutely fantastic. So it was, it was very different. And I didn't much like the look of what was going out on, on the other side. I liked what was in the kitchen. When you said she fried what you caught, where were you catching and what were you catching? Well, Montevideo is a seaport, as you know, and it's, um, 
It had big square boulders about twice the height of a child, which made the key sides. So I'd take a fishing rod and there were lots of other sort of ragamuffins from, from the town who went down there. And we would just all sit and fish with, um, on a bent pin, a bit of wet bread, and you'd get, you'd get fish, and I'd take them home, and <laughs> take them home with the cook. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Proper and, foreign. And were you able to accompany them to the market at that stage, Elizabeth? Did you go to the market? I don't remember doing that. I remember much more going home and that a lot of things were grown outside in, in the little patch, and that there was an earth floor, and there were chickens running in and out. And so um, a lot of the food was was just grown you know there wasn't there wasn't the kind of market thing that you went and got all your vegetables from somebody else there was quite a line of vegetable gardens at the back of the the shanties it was great and, and so how many years were you there how long were you there I was there from the age of seven to eleven so about four years maybe a bit more and then they sent me back to um boarding school in the Malvern Hills it was completely horrifying <laughs> um, I, I had no idea. A horrible brown scratchy tweed uniform, you know, a girls boarding school, girls only. You were banged up there for months. With terrible food, no doubt. Terrible food. And I didn't tell anybody that I could speak French because I could, because that was the diplomatic language. And I learned it when I was three or four, or that I was completely fluent in Spanish because I'd been doing all my lessons in Spanish. Because um, at that point, the English on the whole didn't, didn't trust foreigners. So <laughs> I've kept it very quiet that I could actually speak anything. Any, any well, perhaps at that, that point, it's a suitable point to transition to your next stage, which is uh, how to cook, type and not answer back. Hmm. Um, how to cook? Well, my mother picked the places that she sent me to be educated with a pin. And she thought she was sending me to a finishing school for young ladies. Um, there was one called Hatfield, something like that, Constance Spry, where you learned oh, to yes. yeah, you learned to make canapes and arrange flowers and curtsy to the Queen. Instead of which, she sent me to the Eastbourne School of Domestic Economy, which is in Eastbourne and I think is still going, where I learned how to prepare a room for the sweep. I learned how to clean a room from top to bottom. I learned how to reconstitute whale blubber to look like cream. And I learned how to use elbow grease. And this was, surprised my mother, who was expecting a sort of skill in profiteroles and things like that, when I came back with my certificate, which allowed me to take employment as a housemaid, which is always very useful, I think. You know, I look at a window and think, vinegar and rolled up newspaper, which I didn't <laughs> do. And then, um, I got sent to typing school because um, my mother managed to get me out of um, my boarding school when I was just short of 16 because I was passing exams like you wouldn't believe, you know. And I used, uh, I had my O levels and I was heading for university and my mother reckoned that, um, you know, if I went to university, I would answer back and therefore never get a husband because you don't get husbands if you answer back. Um, she didn't actually clock that it wasn't the um, it wasn't the education that was doing it. <laughs> it was who I was, if you see what I mean. And um, I've been used very much to conducting my own life. So she could see that that was going to be trouble. So no question of university, no question of further education. Typing was what I was going to do. So off I went to Queen's, learned to type. And then... Um, she sent me to Paris and to Florence. That was what you did with young ladies in those days. So Florence was fine. I puddled around and, you know, learned how to roll lasagna and things like that. And then Paris was more interesting because I, there was a school called Mademoiselle Anita's where all nice young English ladies, girls went to learn French. And they took one look at me at Mademoiselle Anita's and said, oh, well, you can speak French. You can go to the Lycée. So I said, where's the Lycée? They said, out of the gates, turn left second building on the whatever it is and just tell them we've sent you. So um, I walked out of the gates and turned right as you would do and somehow managed to make an arrangement with a friend of my brother's who was at school in Switzerland and had French friends and this one was in Paris he was called Gilles and Gilles had a Vespa and Gilles had enrolled in the Sorbonne. So I hopped on the back of Gilles Vespa 
and the Sorbonne um, let you in at that point. They didn't, you know, you didn't have identification. You just sort of walked through. And I found myself in um, Simone de Beauvoir's lecture on um, deuxième sex. And um, this was a revelation because it was sort of exactly what I'd been feeling all along. <laughs> and how old were you at this point, Elizabeth? Was this 17, 16, 17? Somewhere between 16 and 17, yeah. Mm -hmm. 17, 18 was when you were going to be a dead. So that was what I was destined for. So what do you remember about hearing Simone de Beauvoir and what she had to say about feminism at that time? It must have been quite extraordinary. I was totally in agreement with everything she said. You know, <laughs> this was sort of is what I've been feeling all along, and what my mother had been desperately hoping I wouldn't feel. <laughs> and in addition to that was, um, oh, was it Juliette Greco or Jeanne Moreau? Um, there was a whole kind of thing where long, long um, short skirts and long black tights and um, eyelashes like. Um, tarantulas and that kind of thing. So but that, by the time I got back to London, I was completely radicalised, <laughs> had all, all sorts of views on, on the place of women that my mother had rather hoped I managed, I, 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 wouldn't, um, I wouldn't get, and um, didn't look at all like a debutante. But so you came back, we, we, we segued fairly uh, uh, easily there into your third stage, which was Paris, feminism and being a deb. So you were brought back to London to, to, to come out, presumably, yeah. were you? Yeah, what happens is that in the spring, um, you have tea parties with other Debs. So you all, um, you have to have clothes for this because the whole point is that you are marriage material, you're marketed. <laughs> it sounds completely crazy. Um, so you go off, in my mother's case, to, um, places like Hardy Amy's and Norman Hartnell and the people that, um, I mean, to be fashionable in London was very much to go to these places where they measured you and stitched you into things. And I didn't want to be measured and stitched you into anything at all. I, I wanted to wear short black skirts, tarantulas on my eye, eyelashes and um, long black stockings and be, I wanted to be Jean Moreau. And anyway, so um, by the time I hit the, the debutante ball situation, which happens in the summer, um, I could see that it, it wasn't really going to work because the young men, they were called Deb's Delights, they were chosen. They, were, they didn't want any raffish stuff in and out, although raffish stuff obviously did get in and out, mostly in the form of, of people's dads. I was very popular with people's dads and not terribly popular with the young men who were going into Lloyd's and things like that who were considered suitable. So I probably emerged from my, my season. Uh, we were the last who didn't get presented at court. So up until whenever it was, 1968, 69, um, you had to go and curtsy to the queen in your white dress and presented at court with your mother and or a duenna, something like that. And instead of this, um, we had to walk down stairs, along stairs in the Dorchester with a wedding cake at the bottom. So, I mean, what do you think of that? Quite honestly. So there we were in bridal white with some suitable young man accompanying us walking down the stairs and we curtsied to a cake which sort of didn't strike me as appropriate, if you see what I mean. Um, and were, I really, there any other, were there any other well-known names at the time that you could name drop, Elizabeth, that you were coming out with at that time? Well, they all married dukes. So if you want some, you know, the, <laughs> Henrietta Tiax, who married Rutland, and, you know, that, there was a whole stream of, oh, there was, um, I, went to a, I went to a gathering about 10 years ago of um, my year, and it was really interesting because most of us looked like our mothers. You know, we all looked tidy. Some of us had obviously escaped from the whole thing and were looking a bit more raffish. But um, no, there were a lot of dukes and duchesses, and I mean, duchesses married to dukes, obviously. And um, masses of people who just had married the wrong person and, and bolted, usually leaving their children behind with the nanny. It seemed to be sort of <laughs> um, several. Of, of, of that ilk, including a couple that I still, are friends of mine still, um, Millet Delman Radcliffe, very good. She left a note. She married a figure called John Rotner. Nobody in this knows anything about John Rotner or Millet. Millet, are you there? 
no. <laughs> she uh, bolted from a large house in Yorkshire and she left a note for her husband saying that she had run away with, um, he was called Richard and she bought him a, a Lamborghini to run away with on Derby Day and she left a note on the kitchen table saying, Dear John, which was convenient um, because he was called John, um, I, I'm not coming back. Um, your dinner is in the oven. Um, ask the second footman where the oven is. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine that that was really what, what, what the destiny was. But, so but Elizabeth, this whole, this whole experience of having been in Paris, heard Simone de Beauvoir, and then coming back to London and being a dead must have been complete anathema to you. I mean... Well, I was pretty... I mean, in a way, I was obedient. I was still living at home, so I sort of put up with it. And I went out in my Norman Hartnell and my mother's jewellery and my grandmother's mink and that kind of thing. And my only gesture of resentment was to climb on the 19 bus. So in full regalia with satin shoes to match, <laughs> somewhat to the surprise of my, my co-travellers, <laughs> I'd climb on the 19 bus because everything always happened in the middle, Piccadilly Circus or, you know, all those hotels around there. And then my mother used to wait up um, to see that I got home later than midnight rather than before midnight. It was the very reverse, because if I got home later than midnight, I was obviously, you know, doing what I was supposed to do, which was you had a card and you danced with young men. That I answered back to, as you can imagine. <laughs> so the, the, the thing was, your mother failed obviously miserably, Elizabeth, because you came to the end of your time as a dev and you were not um, uh, hitched up and married as was the aim of this. You hadn't found yourself a duke. You'd mm. curtsied to a wedding cake. So mm. let's move on to the next phase of your life now, which you've termed low life, which is art school Soho and private eye. This sounds like much more fun. Move us on to this. Well, fortunately, just after the my debutante year, um, my my family all went to Mexico, so I was kind of left in London in a flat with the rent paid, and um, I had to earn the rest of it. You know, I had to earn a living. So I had my secretarial. Um, I, I I could go and earn a living as a typist. Um, I was set up in Dolphin Square because my mother thought that was very um, respectable, and. Um, two doors down was um, Mandy Rice Davis. And um, so, you know, it wasn't as respectable as she thought it was. It was, there was a lot going on in, in Dolphin Square in those days. And I started off taking jobs in um, estate agents um, because if I took a job somewhere where my skills were appreciated or i.e. that I talk proper, could answer the telephone, could take shorthand in typing and in, in Spanish, French and bookkeeping to trial balance, so hopelessly overqualified. And I would go and take jobs in the typing pool. In those days, there were typing pools. Typing pools were underneath. And so state agents, you went in, you clamped your earphones on and you sat there typing top copies all day. And you got in at nine and you left at five and nobody chased you around the desk. Once they discovered that I could talk proper, I would be promoted to personal assistant, secretary, whatever, when things appeared to be um, requested of me that now would come out on me too. So in those days, it was definitely, you know, pretty young girls come out and have a drink with the clients and you all help and all that kind of thing. So my answer to that was to go and take jobs in, um, in the typing pool. And as soon as I, anybody tried to promote me, I would just go to another typing pool. It was not difficult. And then, um, uh, I mean, at 18, 19, you're, you're not, you're completely indiscriminate. You know what I mean? You just fall in love with the next one and it's all fine. So I fell in love with the next one, <laughs> um, who happened to be a rather good looking Gurkha officer, Andy Osmond, who was starting, he was the money behind a magazine called Private Eye. Okay. So at this point, change of existence. Um, I booked myself in, first of all, to the Byam Shaw, and then it, the, when that was rather expensive because you had to pay for it at art school in the morning, and um, I went to City and Gills, Kennington, 
where they just said, um, have you got a pencil? Have you got a pen? Upstairs to the life room. We'll see you in a year. So they didn't check me in in the afternoon. So I just went off and worked a private eye, which was then just a little yellow rag, really where obviously I was the only one in the office who could actually type because none of the blokes could type. And I was the only one who could add up because none of the blokes could add up. So I was just take a letter, Miss Longmore, I was, take a letter, Miss Longmore. And down the way was the establishment, um, which was London's first, and I think only satire club, which was started with Peter Cook and the Beyond the Fringe lot. So, um, when the eye ran out of money, which, or Andy wanted to go join the foreign office, I think, and wanted his 500 quid back, um, I was sent down the way to see if I could um, do anything with the establishment. The establishment and Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and um, Alan Bennett and um, Jonathan Miller were very serious people, but the eye, they considered to be a bunch of schoolboys. So um, the only one who was interested in picking up um, the eyes offer, which was to replace the 500 quid, was Nicholas Luard. And um, I took one look at Nicholas and thought, yeah, that's that, I like that one. That, that, that. <laughs> I really do like that one. And um, so basically it was an office romance, if you can imagine. And um, uh, he was a bit badly behaved and I went to Mexico for a time at that point. Well, um, how, how much older was he than you, Elizabeth? Were you, was there an age difference? No, not that much. I was, I mean, there was probably about five years, which was normal in those days. You know, it wasn't as if he was very old. He was... And, and what was his, what was his <laughs> background before coming to the eye? What had he been doing before he came to the eye? Uh, he had been at Cambridge um, with the Footlights people um, who had started Beyond the Fringe. Um, he was a double first in English, which was lovely because um, having no education myself, it was really exciting to, um, you know, to listen to somebody who could recite Andrew Marvel without a hitch. And then he had been teaching in Philadelphia, um, Penn University actually, Anglo-Saxon poetry. I mean, it really is very romantic and he was very good looking and I was very shallow so you know <laughs> the two together so you, was so you, you, you fled you fled to Mexico to give yourself a bit of space and headspace and thinking time and then you came back and got married no he came out to Mexico and with how a, romantic how romantic I know, he chased I, you halfway around the world he did, he did he did he came out to Mexico with a downhill cigarette lighter without anything in the initial square and a proposal of marriage. <laughs> and um, I was quite surprised. I said, you can take that back if you want to. And I really, you know, because it's the height and all the rest of it. No, 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 he wanted to get married and we'd better tell my mother as quickly as possible. My mother, um, because Nicholas was, for her, the way that she saw it, incredibly disreputable. You know, he was all over the papers as the king of satire. He was, pretty notorious for sort of running around with all sorts of people that um, my mother wouldn't have approved of at all. I mean, you have to remember that I would get fined for appearing in the newspapers or not. I would get carpeted by my mother if um, it was anything except the tattler in wearing, you know, pearls. So um, the idea of um, Nicholas, who was, you know, he was in the Daily Sketch. You remember the Daily Sketch? He was in the, you know, he was sort of full page everywhere. And my mother was well aware of this. And um, she said, well, I suppose I ought to congratulate you. I thought I got the plum in the plum pudding. <laughs> my mother was not at all approving. So yes, I got married, I got married, I got married. And pretty soon I had my first child. And um, that sort of changed things because, I mean, I, I just love babies. I think they're completely, you know, they're so easy they only have three things wrong with them, indigestion, nappies, oh, <laughs> indigestion, nappies, and they're tired, that's all. I mean, Where I'm, did you set up home, Elizabeth? Where did you set up home? Nicholas had a, a flat in um, Hyde Park Square, which was, um, again, it was, it's now a very, very sort of smart end of London, but then it was kind of mar marginal. 
and he had various young women living there. I mean, we had a back room, and um, I'm not sure how. I, I didn't. I mean, I didn't look too closely at what his domestic arrangements were, which was probably a saving grace, and that continued throughout our marriage. Um, not anyway. Um, he had, I think, Jeff Bernard in the back room at one point. So, and Fenella Fielding lived upstairs, and um, Jeff Bernard tried to. Um, he put his head in the gas oven. Um, there are various stories attached to this, and um, he took it out again to answer the telephone. We were away for the weekend. So it was obviously wasn't very committed to the whole thing. And- um, I thought he spent most of his time at the French pub. Yeah, he did. Well, when he wasn't at the French pub, he was in the box room, which rather annoyed me because I had a baby and it would have been really nice if Jeff hadn't been in the box room, <laughs> but he was. And um, then, uh, because- Vanilla Fielding must have been fun to have as a, as <laughs> <laughs> as a lodger. Rather tiresome. She was upstairs and Jeff was completely besotted by her and was sometimes allowed in, which would mean that he'd come crashing downstairs and having forgotten his keys and have to be let in at four in the morning, um, you know, after an enthusiastic um, evening with Fenella <laughs> upstairs, <laughs> three in the morning. So, and it was also 60s London. Um, people were really young and having fun and I had a baby, and then I had another baby. And I suddenly discovered that um, unlike among the Latins, uh, babies were not welcome everywhere. They weren't, you know, it's much better now, but you used to get signs in places saying, um, no, no babies or dogs, no children or dogs, no children or dogs, possibly Irish on the end of that as well. So it was not a, a friendly place to be down the King's Road pushing a buggy um, with another toddler, and um, I, my mother gave me enough money to buy a house in Battersea, which again was, that was the sort of bride price, if you see what I mean, it sounds very old-fashioned now, and anyway, in Kersley Street, so I'd moved there, and then um, I kind of, I used to go to Spain, um, I used to go to Spain, to Marbella, that area, Torremolinos, which was then a fishing port, as everybody always says. And um, because um, Nicholas had friends down there, I could speak the language. And I discovered what I already knew, really, was that children in Spain are loved and admired. And, you know, yet they're allowed to eat grapes for, in the market. And, you know, the, the whole attitude was completely different. So eventually, maybe after about two or three years, I uh, decided to build a house in a, it was a valley pretty much overlooking Africa. I know it sounds very irresponsible, but um, I didn't know how to behave. If you can understand so far that I didn't have any role models, if you see what I mean. So I just did what came into my head. And Nicholas had a publishing company um, lesson for you, Anne, which um, <laughs> you managed to, it was quite a good publishing company. It was one of those, um, it, it made books for other people, you know, big illustrated books and did some good work and ran out of money. And then I signed something called a joint and several. Do you know what a joint and several is? A joint and several is when the bank says, we will lend you some money um, if you guarantee your husband's company's overdraft. So, okay, I said, and I, I said, what's the overdraft? And they told me, and it seemed to be within what I could afford. It turned out that a joint and several applied to the entire company, which meant that um, having sold oh, we've the house- lost. We've frozen. Oops. Elizabeth is frozen. Why? I'll see. Uh, I'll come in again, okay? Can you see me now? Stop video. Uh, I don't think it was just frozen for me anyway. Have I thrown frozen for me? Anne's frozen for me. You're not frozen to me, um, Elizabeth. It's Jackie here. You're, you're not frozen. I, I wonder whether Anne's having little trouble. Yeah, Anne's frozen. 
Yeah. So, so okay. why don't you carry on, So um, I signed a joint in several, and that meant that um, the house in Spain had to go, by which time I had four children, and um, kind of life really changed at that point. Uh, I still, the four children were brilliant, because in Spain, um, I'd started making a bit of money as a natural history artist. And it, it went pretty well. Um, I was working for Q um, as a botanical artist because they were, um, they were doing a, a, an exploration of the, um, the Andalusian flora. So I learned how to do that. And some, actually the other day, somebody came up to me and said that they'd got the drawings had, from Q had gone to Reading University and they were stacked up there. So that was rather nice. And because we were on a migration path, um, I painted birds, people like owls. So I had a couple of exhibitions at the Tran Gallery in Cork Street. So that kind of started me on a career as a, a natural history artist. And the botan botanical work is very detailed. And the birds, um, again, I was quite Audubon, so I liked painting the feathers and everything. And then um, I sort of changed route a little bit because um, the botanical work led me to do a piece for Simon Courtauld at the field, which was known as the Hedgerow Spectator at that point, um, because basically quite a lot of the spectator escapees, um, they went to the field. So I got a column writing about food as a result of having done a piece on the, the road to Ronda. And um, the editor, who had been the deputy editor of The Spectator, Simon Courthill, um, knew that I cooked well, that I was a good cook. So could I do that? So I said, sure. How long, how much, how often? And um, the answer was every week, uh, 600 words, do a drawing as well. And um, that sort of, that worked pretty well. So I did the field for, I did the column on the field. It worked well enough because um, as you can understand that I was um, in Spain, I kept rabbits, um, was quite happy. I had to keep a pig. This is for Lulu Norman, if you're there. This is a story of a pig um, that my neighbors said, you are throwing too much stuff away. So you have to keep a pig. And in those days, in, I, I've lost Anne, so she's not keeping me on track. Isn't it wonderful? So in the forest around me, they ran Iberico pigs, you know, the Pata Negra, the Blackfoots, the old um, foraging pigs. And at that time in Spain, all the pigs were the Pata Negra, the Ibericos. The large English white only came in about the 80s and were still in 1970s. And um, so I kept a pig. I had to be taught how to do the business with turning it into hams and chorizo. And we were too damp for the hams. So they had to go up on donkey back to Ronda to be cured in the mountain air, which is why uh, Spanish hams are called serrano. Serrano means a mountain. So there's a whole process that's very different from the Parma ham. And um, I had to learn how to um, make chorizo. They just looked at me and they said, didn't your mother teach you anything? Which the answer was not likely. So um, quite a lot. I had to be taught how to plant chickpeas and when to dry them. And I mean, there's a huge amount that I learned. And the other things that I learned were the fact that my children attended local schools, walked down the, um, the road to school, in, first of all. And they learned from their school friends how to pick what you could eat, some very odd things along the road, because on either side of the road at that point, there were transhumancing a metre wide on either side of every important road it was free for the picking. Almonds, we weren't olives, that could have been. And all the greens you fed to your rabbits. I kept rabbits, I didn't keep chickens because the bakery kept chickens and there was no point in doing what other people did. Um, bakery baked once, once a day, huge loaves that were sold by weight. Um, 
And then, um, so I learned all the bases of what subsequently became European peasant cookery, which was what I probably made my name on because it was the first, after the taking a job at the field, it was the first thing that I, um, the first book that I, I really wanted to write. Um, at a certain point at that, in that particular life when, um, there weren't as many cookery writers, there weren't as many opportunities as there are now. Um, then uh, publishers said, you know, is there something, no, actually my agent said, do you want to write a book? And I said, yes, but I don't think anybody's going to publish it. And I want it to be called this because my life to date had shown me that on the one side of the green baize door, that cooking was over there and on the other side people were cooking from what they grew, what they husbanded, what they could catch and that this was a very different attitude and it was an attitude that I had to learn to cope with when I lived in Spain and I took my children to France for a year in a French school. I mean they've had to have um, psychiatric hope all, all their life I think considering <laughs> the transitioning that they did and um so I, I could see that there was a system, a, a way of living that could be applied anywhere. So yeah. all you have to do is go to the market, look and see what's, you know, what people are growing. And then because I had stopped earning my living as a botanical and bird painter, because my eyesight had changed and I could either start, you know, doing detailed work or I could use it as a tool. So. I began to, well, the illustration carried on. So, you know, that that did carry on, but it carried on much more because um, the possibility was there. And if I wrote something and the art editors and the editors, the word editors don't necessarily see eye to eye. So you've got to please both of them. And if you're lucky, like I am at the oldie, which is where I am now, um, that was a, you know, read the oldie. Um, where <laughs> every month uh, and the art editor likes my work so my work is illustrated by my own drawings and this actually as a way of communicating is quite important to me it's like when you're you know making your own food when you're doing the home styling yourself and so for me um, if I, I I want to emphasize something I can do it as an illustrator so I set off um, with my I got a, I got a, I got a, a decent advance enough to allow for my proposal. It must have been a good proposal. I better look up it again. Um, for <laughs> European peasant cookery, and from Bantam Trans World, which was you know big publisher, yeah. and there were three publishers bidding for it. So um, it kind of went to the point where I had enough to go and do the work. So I had to do two big sweeps, um, one through Eastern Europe. Um, starting at, in, in Munich and then um, Nicholas came with me rather surprisingly I didn't think he would but he did hiring a car in Munich and then going all the way through Greece Macedonia Yugoslavia um, well Yugoslavia before going to Greece and then in to look at the Ottoman Empire so I stopped at the limits of the Ottoman Empire Hungary Austria because they were so influential that the Turks yeah. were so influential that it was impossible to ignore it and then I did a, another big sweep around Scandinavia and um, taking my sketchbooks with me all the time. And if I didn't have the language and wanted to know if there was honey in it, I probably had to go zzzz or um, <laughs> go like that. But on the other hand, um, my sketchbooks um, allow me to communicate. I can sit in the market and all the kids will come up and then their mothers will be interested and there'll always be... Um, There'll always be in the market a stall where everything for want for the national dish is laid out. If it's beans and vegetables, it'll right. all be on the same place. So, and I did a lot of homework before I went. I was reading 19th century travellers. Um, where's Anne? Is she back again? Uh, Anne's um, having trouble with her with her internet. So, um, but, so but you're I, doing very well without Anne, I'm afraid. <laughs> Because we're all banged up. I get very excited. Oh, and Anne is, is in the background there. And hey. I'm not <laughs> um, but um, remind me, what year was this, uh, Elizabeth? 
1986, 87. The, and how um, long did this great trip. trip take? Only about sort of two or three, couple of months maybe um, for the Eastern European one and maybe a month for the Scandinavian one. Right. And before, beforehand, I had sat in the library, not in cookery book sections, but the London Library, which you can go into the stacks, mm. is wonderful. And I was in topography. And I discovered that, um, well, the books that were interesting and had food in them in topography were written either by vicars or women. So right. all I had to do was go down and the vicars or the women, because the vicars had no money. Actually, it wasn't the vicars, it was the rectors. They were, they were walking in between 1880 and 1920 and really surprised by what they saw. Right. So before I did my trips, I'd done all that homework. Yeah. And um, so really I was looking at something that I already understood and I had the botany. So mm -hmm. I could look in a field and I could know, pretty much expect the kind of tears of what would grow and then what would eat what would grow. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's a, that's the sort of basis of, 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 I mean, when I talk about my career, my nine lives or whatever, they kind of move one into another. One feeds the other one. So I wouldn't say I'd had a change of career, simply that one goes into the other. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, from what you're saying, it's no wonder that European peasant uh, cookery is still out there. That that Anne reissued it in I think twenty, well, sixteen years ago, and yeah. it's still out there and still loved by so many. Um, I, I'm wondering, do you have those old notebooks that you carried around Europe and Scandinavia with you? Do you have those? Oh yes, yes, I've got great boxes of them. <laughs> a real treasure, I'm sure. Fantastic. Well, if I want to write to something, I get out an old notebook, a, a, an yeah. old book, you know, yeah. there because it'll tell me everything I need to know. Yeah, oh, lovely. Now, um, we were hoping that people might put some questions to you um, in the chat, but I, they haven't, they haven't come thus far. Um, I see we've got some great um, uh, people listening in here. Um, Jenny Linford, hello today. Um, have you got a question for Elizabeth? You have to unmute yourself, Jenny. Oh, yeah, hi, sorry, yeah, just doing that. Hello, everyone, lovely to see you. Hello. <laughs> Storyteller you are, my goodness. Um, I was actually really interested in this idea of, of the illustration and this you know, the fact it's words and pictures for you and what, and in a way the power, or when you look back at your sketchbooks, presumably you are taken back there, you know, the, and I've seen you sketch yourself. It, like, you know, it must be very evocative, I suppose. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I could even go and fetch a sketchbook. I don't know if people can see it if I hold it up to the screen. They probably can, can't they? Hang on a sec. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, sometimes one's got to get it positioned right, doesn't one? Um, I go on a, a, wait a minute, I'm going to pin so I can see. Pin video. Okay. Right. Oh, wow. Yep. Oh, that is people um, scooping seeds out of pumpkins in Bulgaria. Oh, or is it you? Let me tell you. Hmm. Ah, Austria. Sorry about that. Um, and I walked over and said, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, well, what you always do with pumpkins, which is you, you scoop out the seeds and then you roast them and then you mill them and you make seed oil. Mm -hmm. and yeah. um, yes, the Austrian um, pumpkin seed oil is, um, is, is one of the finest, isn't it? Yes. And it seemed to be, I said, you use it for frying. They said yes, which would be surprising because it's now become a sort of quite a, it's a chef's ingredient, isn't mm. it? Mm. Sauce, things like that. And um, I said, what do you do with the flesh? And they said, what do you do with it? So I said, well, you know, pumpkin soup or something like that. The Americans make pumpkin pie and some of us make pumpkin cake. And they said, how crazy, we give it to the cows. <laughs> 
So, um, fleshed cows. Yeah, uh, it's very, very, very useful. So you never actually know what kind of answer you're going to get. And you usually, the, the act of, of painting, um, where's my sketchbook thing? Um, I've got a little sketch, I've got a little box that sits on my thumb. And oh. I, I have a, not, this is one of the, this is a big, um, you want to see some reindeer? Mm. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. <laughs> How lovely. Yeah. Oh. Um, and it sits on my thumb, and it's about the, my usual sketchbooks are about this size, so about the size of my hand, and I can paint standing up. Ah. I don't have to sit down. And the paint box has got a little water container, and it's got everything that I need. And I've just got back, as I said, from Turkey, from Cappadocia, and um, I only took one sketchbook, which was a mistake, because... Um, let me see where it is. Ha ha ha. Here we are. Where's Anne gone? Um, I'm afraid yeah. Anne has gone. She sends her apologies, but her broadband has really let her down today. Mm. So um, I'm going to show you something. Anybody guess what this is? Uh, in the establishment, we used to have Lenny Bruce. He used to do this all the time, looking for things. And <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Oh. Can you see that? Can you mm. see? Yes, you can see that. Yes. Look at those mushroomy things. Is that not Cappadocia or not? It's Cappadocia. Oh. Ah. <laughs> so those are the formations which people scooped out and lived in. Here's another one. See that? Amazing. And so that sits on my, I hold it like that. And then there's a paint box on my thumb. And... I can have a conversation with people in the market um, and it gives me enough time to see what I'm looking at and understand what I'm looking at, which I think maybe if you've got a camera or an iPhone, it doesn't. It's also non-invasive. So whoever you're, it's an interaction between somebody sitting down and looking at, um, you know, yeah or whatever it is or telling you what they're doing in I've got no Turkish but if I want to know what's in it and I want to know if they put clothes in the um, pekmez or something like that I can just do a little drawing and people yeah. understand you so it's exactly like well, if you go into the Lascaux caves well to me the Lascaux caves are just a menu you know I'll have a couple of antelope and one of those and don't you come back till you've got one so um, the kind of communication that uh, and you go into churches and then you will have these the stories, you know, in the old churches in Bulgaria and Cappadocia. Um, people, people learn from those frescoes, you know, they sit there and they're listening to the priest going on or the, I saw whirling dervishes in the pitch dark, so no frescoes. Um, as a way of, it's, a, it's just, it's, it's what we use now in photographs to illustrate cookbooks. People really like Cook, you know the illustrations in cookbooks we know that yeah there is a kind of return I think to handiwork there's a return to illustrating by hand it's mm -hmm. not um it's very often designer work i.e um you know it's sort of block images and sometimes it's drawn on on the computer but I have hopes that it's um coming back in again I hope so too um Elizabeth I had one or two questions here um Beth Paz, um, one I of our international dams, she, she asked, um, how has your life um, <laughs> and their childhood influence, influenced the lives of your children? Um, I think we'd have to ask them to tell you the truth. I think they get, because I use their experience quite a lot in my writing although I would never speak for them. So um, they've certainly got two languages um, as well as their own. And that definitely gives you a different perspective. So they can go to France or Spain and actually Cass, my son lives in New York where there's a tremendous amount of uh, Latin speak, spoken there. So to the extent that the languages were very useful. And also I think that childhood with understanding that, you know, you 
chickens come, chickens lay eggs, they come to the end of their lives, they go into the boiling pot. Rabbits breed like rabbits, because we did keep rabbits. And um, I used to kill and skin the rabbits, so, and the pig got slaughtered and um, yeah. stuck into chorizo and all the rest of it. So they had a very, very strong understanding of where food comes from. And I didn't, that's, I wanted that for them. I wanted yes. them to be able to understand that, you know, that, that at a certain point, they're just going to do their own thing, aren't they? Yes. But have any of them ended up working within this whole field I, of food or um, writing? Poppy did. Um, the, my, um, the number three in the line, she went and worked as a chef. Um, she went in to work at um, DeLugo's, you know, Andy Wall Thompson's place. Oh, yes. Um, she went in because a friend of hers was just taking a job as a washer up and things like that. Actually, just washer up. And he saw that she could be promoted and she was on hot pans in double kip time and then took that. Um, she cooked in the, the chef's restaurant in um, Queen's. Uh, Queensgate, that one, yeah, upstairs. And she took there. Oh, I see. Yes, I know. But she also now she's um, back again in what she always wanted to do, which is um, she's a designer in the movies. Oh, so yeah, she got her husband is also um, David Lee has just done Brave New World, design there. So she she works with him quite a bit. So she says, I mean, kitchen work is just. You don't want to do it for too long. It's really hard. It's, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. Um, and they, there was, and there was oh another God. question. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. There was another question from Marini Edwards. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, she was saying, um, "Oh, did she, well, she was saying as far as the pumpkins. This wasn't the pumpkin wasn't native to Austria." So what oil did they use before they started using pumpkin oil so extensively? Would you know that? No, I wouldn't. It's a very good question because it's one I always ask. What did you use before you ate pump potatoes? Because potatoes seem to figure very strongly. Well, um, if you look at the way that it's used, I would imagine, because it's used for shallow frying, so I imagine it would be grease or butter, so it wouldn't be an oil goose fat or butter um, yeah. or lard. So it's, yes. it's a popular substitute for that. And then in chefs, in the high-end chefs, it is used as much as like a sauce really, isn't it? It's not yeah. used uh, as a frying medium. No. So, um, that's, that's probably the likely one. I was yeah. trying to find that in Cappadocia, in that incredible dry landscape. And um, in the caves dug out of the, the rocks, um, which is soft tufa, volcanic. And um, it looks as if nothing would grow. And then you suddenly see there's a line of poplars, which says that there is a, an aquifer, right, you know, and that roots can get down there. And you suddenly realize that um, in spite of seeing peppers and tomatoes and pumpkins and potatoes in the markets, that what you also see are quite small fruits, um, small apples, um, nispero, I don't, anybody remember what, you know, the little, um, unmute? Um, well, like the, um, loquats, crab apples. Yeah, like it's not, yeah. Yeah. yes, it's oh. a little orange one, member of the rose family. Well, little tiny ones they had. So that, and also walnuts and almonds and vines used by the Christians for winemaking, but also for pecmes. Um, which is that sort of jelly that you cook down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's not molasses, it's a jelly. And there's also the pomegranates. So you can imagine, and there are, um, I don't know if I um, put up a picture of that. I don't think I did. Um, pigeons too, um, scooping out little holes for pit nesting pigeons. Right. So um, that's the sort of thing that I, you know, that one, and the question about the pumpkins, what did they use before? That's absolutely the sort of question that um, you carry around with you and it's sort of automatic response to whatever you see. Now, I must ask you, um, Hilary Sharp has said that Nicholas wrote a wonderful account of the time in southern Spain. She'd like to be reminded of the title. 
Too. Yes, it's um, Andalusia, and the drawings in it are mine. Hooray! So it is, it's a very good book, and it was about our time in Spain. And it's, uh, he was a good travel writer. I mean, that's how he earned his living. He was a novelist, a thriller writer. Yeah. Travel writer. So, um, and that, that seems to be still um, very affectionate. I have six copies of it. Hi. I found them the other day. Fantastic. Along I with think we are just about at the end of our time. Um, so I need to remind people um, that, well, in fact, I see on the chat, we have been reminded that um, uh, we'll be drawing a prize winner for the free signed copy of Preserving Pot and Pickling. Um, and the reminder that uh, Anne Dollamore at Grub Street is offering 25% off that and the flavours of Andalusia. Um, so don't forget that and do go on to Grub Street um, and Anne at grubstreet.co.uk and quote lay down to get your promotion code, promo code. I'm back, um, Jackie. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I had to relocate and dash from home to the office. Oh, what well, a nightmare. Anyway, you oh, carry yeah, on. Friend, to that's fantastic. That back. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anne, I, I was just winding up. I've reminded everyone about, um, about the offer and, um, and, and the draw, and, and, and as you said earlier, you can't get to see Elizabeth for a couple of weeks um, until she's out of quarantine. So, um, so any, any book signing might not happen for a couple of weeks. Um, ooh, what have I got there? Hilary Sharp saying, if there's a copy of Nicholas's book, would be happy to purchase. So I'm leaving that with you for now, Elizabeth. I can't answer on the chat. I, oh, I can only do it to everyone. So, Hilary, get in touch with me direct. Yeah. Okay. All right. And what? Blah, 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 blah. Could you please send information on the Grub Street books on the chat? Yes, we'll do that. Um, Sue or uh, Christine, please, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, so, well, it just leaves me really to to say thank you so much, Elizabeth. I. I just wish this would go on all afternoon, quite honestly. Um, haven't got much else to do these days. So um, would be very happy to sit here and chat all afternoon, but I'm sure you're far busier than I. Um, but that was really fabulous. Uh, I feel as though we've only just scratched the surface, but um, perhaps we'll, we'll have another, another trip down your memory lane um, and into your lives again. Anne, have you got, Anne Dollamore, have you got anything more to add? No, I'm just so disappointed that, that Elizabeth and I are in full flow and then just suddenly I discover that, I thought at first it was Elizabeth because she froze on my screen oh. and then it came up saying I had no connection. So I dashed to the phone to phone up Blasted Virgin Media who confirmed that the broadband was down. It, it would take 10 minutes to test the equipment and get it up and running again. So I jumped into the car and tore out to the office to try and get myself in for the tail end. So I'm happy to have been here for the tail end. Elizabeth, it was wonderful chatting to you as ever. You, you and I always know that we, we could go on for hours and hours. I'm just sorry that there was a hiatus in the middle of it. Well, it was fabulous and um, thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, it's been a lovely way to spend a lunchtime and, um, and do keep your eyes open for the rest of our series. Um, and we'll, we'll meet again sometime soon. Thank you very much indeed.